right. <clears throat> Thanks for coming for this to this week's session, CMS training session. Um, we have uh, Claire today, who will be talking about and who will giving her starting her session, her uh, starting her Python beginner sessions. Um, these will be three sessions, if I'm not mistaken. In the, and they will be weekly. So the next one will be next week, Wednesday. OK, she's not. <laughs> Claire does not look disapprovingly, so that's correct. <laughs> and um, I hope you have fun, and I hope you, we all learn something. And I'm handing off to Claire. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I wanted to stress again, um, this is a beginner person. Um, Training, but we we assume that you already know how to program in at least one other language. So we're not going to tell you what the variable is, what an assignment is, or stuff like that. So it's just to present this um, concept in Python. Um, but we assume you know those concepts already in another language at least. And also, the three sessions will be relatively generic. Python knowledge and not so much applied to uh, climate science. And we will have a more applied uh, Python training on climate science later on when we go into a special package that's called x -ray that uh, we think is very, very good for climate science. Um, but this is a, a lot more generic than that. OK, so I will start with sharing my screen. Okay, do you all see the screen? Nobody complains? Yes, okay. thank you. Okay, so um, as you can see, it's a web browser because I strongly, strongly, strongly encourage you to start learning Python using notebooks because they are a lot easier to go through the code and see, you can see line by line what you're doing. And so it's a lot easier to learn and make sure uh, you're debugging at the same time you're writing pretty much. So um, it's really, it's really helpful. And it has an inline help. So it avoids you switch. It kind of gives you a bit more help than just a plain uh, text editor. Okay, so let's start. Um, we are going to start with strings because it's a relatively common type. So um, it's likely you already know, already know what a string is, but uh, they will be useful for us to introduce a lot of Python concepts. So this week we're going to see what an object-oriented language means because Python is an object-oriented language. We see the print function and how to format the string. We we'll see indexing, loops, and if constructs. So the building blocks of pretty much a lot of languages. OK, so let's create our first variable. That's a string. So a equal a string. Here it's my name. Um, here I use double um, quotes. You can use single quotes. I'm French, so double quotes are much easier in French. Uh, but yeah. So um, I execute the cell. Um, if you haven't used notebooks before, Hoga gave a training on notebooks before uh, in March, I think. Uh, we, we can send you back the link to it um, after the training. To execute the cell is simply shift return. Um, and you have a number of it. OK. so. Uh, if you can, you can check easily in a notebook what the value of your variable is by simply putting the your variable name. So if I execute it, as the output is clear, it's fine. And I can do all this in one cell as long as I put the variable name alone at the last line of the cell, it will work the same. Okay. First thing to know, Python is case sensitive, so. Uh, here, it gives me an error. I don't have a variable named A. Capital A, I have one only in lower case. 
And another thing to know, for example, with strings is you can add strings. So if I have B is my uh, family name and C is A plus B, then C is simply my whole name together. Um, so up to there, I think there's no real surprises, or, or, but um, if you have any questions, anything? Okay. So what is an object-oriented language? So first thing to know is everything in Python is an object. And that means a variable contains more than a value. It may also contain functions that are called methods. These are specific to each object type. So depending on what your object is, so if I have a string, for example, I have a list of different methods attached to it. But if I add another object, uh, like a numbers don't really have, um, method attached to it, but there are other objects like list and tuples and whatever we're going to see later. Those also have method attached to it to them, which are different from the one attached to strings. And you can also have attributes. Um, attributes are typically the metadata about your variable. Um, and they are a bit like method, except they're not function, just simply values. There can be another object. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be one single value. It can be complicated, but it's not a function. OK, so it's really useful to always keep track of what of the top of your, uh, what object are your variables, because you can't obviously use the same function on all of them. So in a notebook, you have inline help, as I told before. So if you put the integration mark A and you um, execute the cell, you see this thing appears. It tells you A is a str, so it's a string. Um, in this case, it's, its value is clear. It has a length of six. And it gives you a bit more uh, information about what str is. Um, it can create a string object and whatever. Okay, which, um, so that's where, you know, using a notebook is useful because it gives you a bit more information. You can also have inline help to find methods associated with your object. So if I have my object A, I know it's a string. The methods are called with a dot. So A dot. And after you can have the name of an attribute of a method. But I don't know yet what the name to put. So in the notebook, if you press tab, no, not tab. Yeah, tab. It gives you a list there that all the list of attributes and methods associated with a string. So I can say I want the one that's called split. And you click on it and it's printed. And I know, I know it's a method, so I can, since it's a method, it's a function, and a function is called with parentheses. But here I forgot what, it, what arguments it needs. So I can put shift tab and give me a little spill here that tells me uh, what the possible arguments are. And for the moment, it's very short. If I can press the plus if I want, and it, and it lists a bit more information. I can put the hat there, and it, and if we put it here, so it's always present, I can refer to it more easily. So that's the way to get some help, additional help in the notebooks, and that's why those notebooks are very useful. Uh, so split, I didn't read, but split, I uh, split a sentence into its words, depending on the separator. Um, so in this case, if I run it and press A, it didn't split anything because the uh, um, default separator is the space and there's no space in my string. So it's just still the same. But yeah, it just works anyway. Okay, so if you're not in a notebook and you want, still want to know what your type is and a list of not methods, etc., you have uh, functions that are built in in Python. 
So the first one is type. And obviously, it's to know the type of your variable. So if I press type A, it's telling me it's a str, so it's a string. And the second one is dear, um, which will list all the attributes and methods of an object. So if I list those, you'll see it's a long list. It doesn't tell me which one are attributes, which one are objects, uh, methods, sorry. Uh, but at least it gives me an idea of what to look for and uh, see if I can find something that sounds promising for what I want to do. One last thing, it lists also a lot of things like that with double unders underscore. I don't look at them for the moment. There are, um, there are methods and attributes that are core to the to the type and usually are not for user to use. Um, they are very advanced uh, concepts of how the object is, is done. Um, for example, this one will define how to compare two strings together and know which one is uh, smaller than the other. So um, you don't want to touch them and use them. It just, yeah. So the ones you want to do to look at are the ones uh, without the underscore, double underscores. And that's true for any object. Um, you may have some point maybe to look into the other ones, but that's a lot more advanced usage. Okay, is there any questions on objects and how it works? Just to make sure, I want to uh, really make the point. You have some built-in functions that are called directly like this, like you type the name of the function and then your object in it. And the methods are called like this. So you have your object dot, the name of your method. And then this method is applied on this object. Um, so be mindful, it can be uh, tricky at the start to know which one is which. Um, just remember the two ways. Okay, so after we're going to see the print function for uh, Python, because that's useful to when you start coding. Uh, it's relatively simple. You can print the value of all sorts of objects, so you don't have to convert your object to string if you have a if you have a number, you don't have to convert it to string first. It will work for you, uh, do the conversion. Um, so yeah, just do print your object. Normally it works. If it doesn't work, then we can see, but it works 99% of the cases. So if I do print A, you see it just print Claire. Um, it doesn't print quotes because in this case, that's the way the print function works. You can print several variables together by simply putting a comma between. And it will look like this, like on a one line. You can do it this way or that way. You can, um, you know, put as many variables as you want. You just, it will work. Um, you can see here uh, what happens is that A is Claire, and I have a comma, and I have it's me, and the print function has added a space into each of my variables because I define those as different variables. If instead I put, if I put, if I create one string with a plus, there will be no comma, no um, space in between. Okay. Okay, so now that we know how to print our strings, we can also obviously format the strings. And it gets complicated in Python because of historical reasons. They change a lot the way to format the strings. So we're going to start with a new way of doing it and then see the other ways afterwards because you might encounter them.
So the new way is called the F string. So let's say I have two numbers, A equal 100 and B equal 50. And I want to say I have 50% off something, so it costs $100. So the way it's called an F string because you simply start with an F here and then you'll put your string in quotes. And the way you do it is each time you want to put the value of a variable, you simply put these curly braces with the variable name inside. Okay? And uh, Python will uh, understand it and calculate this variable name um, and return it as you would expect. So you see, it's, it understands that B is 50, so it puts 50, and it understands that A is 100, so it puts 100. And you can see there is a difference in between the two numbers that 50 was declared as an integer, was 100 with a dot was declared as float, so it added a zero when the print um, happened. So it's a relatively simple way to format strings um, and it can be easier than having a plus between all those different strings, uh, easier to read. Um, so to format, the, to format how your variables are interpreted by Python, um, you have a lot of choice there. Python refer to all the way to format as a format specification mini language. The complete documentation is linked here. We're not going to look at the complete specification here. We're just going to go through a few examples that I think are the most useful, but depends on a bit on what you're doing. You can format uh, floats. So here you see I leave B, which is an integer as it is. And I say I want A, so my variable is here. And I put, um, sorry, so, um, I always forget the name of this symbol in English. Semicolon, I think. Oh. Yeah. And uh, I want it to be three, um, a length of three characters, and no characters after the uh, comma, and it's a float. Um, it's a float with three characters, no characters after the comma. So if I do that, um, you I typically get rid of the dot zero here um, and just it appears like that. Um, another thing that's often useful, especially for file names, is if you want to put a number on the left with zeros. Um, you can do it with floats as well as integers or anything, numbers. And that's this way. So um, you say it's a length of, you want a number to be length of six characters in total. And everything that's on the left that doesn't have a character, you put a zero instead. Um, and that's a notation for a float here without a missing after the comma. So if I print this, you see, in the first case, because A is a float and I didn't give any format for A itself, it puts a comma dot zero. And in the second one, because I say I want six characters and nothing after the comma, it just prints 100 and three zeros. Is it all good so far? Yes. You can obviously have exponent notations for your floats. Um, so if you put a E alone, it gives you um, the st one standard, he, the default he has, and you can choose how many characters to put, uh, just as with F. Um, yeah. Okay, so this is for the F string and how to format string. So the how to format string is the same, the, like the, how, how the, the format specification mini language is the same for any way you print your string. As I said, there's uh, three ways for uh, Fortran to, 
to call a string with format. And so all this and uh, all this is the same no matter how you you call your, your string, whether you use a F string or you use another uh, method of formatting. Okay, the other method of formatting is the string method format. So it's a string method, so you see it's str dot format. And str dot format, that means here you put a string and it's a dot format and the format method is applied to the string you've put in the front. So it looks like this. So again, it's a print, but so if I have a, a string here, dot format, and I put in my format function, I put the variable I want to put in the string that is in front. And to say where I want to put this, the value of this uh, variable in, I just put curly braces again um, in my string at the, at the, on the left. So you see, it's just telling me it's hundred dollars. Uh, you can put several variables into the same string, and uh, you can you can refer to the for, to the arguments of format by position or by name. So here again, if I have my a one hundred dollars and b fifty percent off. I can write it these two ways. So I can say uh, I want to format A and B. So B is my second argument, A is my first argument, and Python start at zero. So A is index zero, is argument zero, and B is argument uh, one. And so in my um, string, it looks like this with curly braces zero for A, curly braces one for B. What I find is a lot more readable is to give names by simply calling the arguments with a keyword. In the case of format, you can give whatever keyword. So here you choose whatever name you want, equal a variable that exists. Okay, so I know B is my percentage and A is my cost, so I call it cost and percentage. And so here in my string on the left, I can simply refer it as cost and percentage and it's a lot more easier to remember which one is which. Okay, and it gives me the same sentence at the end, obviously. And as I said, it's the same mini language for formatting, so you can add the same uh, type of formatting to your, to your strings. Uh, if you have a keyword argument, you put the keyword name first, if you just have an argument, you put nothing first, you just put the, the formatting like that. If you have a position argument, you just put um, zero here, and that's the position of your argument in the formats method. Okay, and then it just formats without the comma. Uh, if you want to learn more about strings and formatting and so on, and um, the Python manual has a lot of details, uh, but this uh, is, I found is pretty good. So um, you can just go through it. And finally, there is another way again to write strings. I, I'm not going to go through in details because you shouldn't use it. But I'm just putting it there because you might encounter it if you read some code written by someone else. And this old way is to put the string, percent, your vi the variable, and in the string it's a percent and a symbol. It is a S because my variable is a string. Uh, for those of you who might not know C, it's a bit the C way of formatting string. Um, but yeah. So here again, it gives me the same output. It works, but just don't use it. I learn the other ways. Um, okay, is there any questions about string formatting? Or, or this? I know we saw a few concepts on the way about 
keyword arguments and stuff like that. Was this clear or do you want to go back through it? Okay, I'll take it as clear. Okay, next thing, indexing. Strings are indexable, indexable in Python. Um, in Python, indexes always start at zero. And it's possible to have negative indexes. And it works such that minus one refers to the last argument, the last element, minus two refers to the one before last, and so on. So it goes, it goes through the, it goes through the variable from last to first, if you put a negative sign. So here, again, if I go back to my string Claire and I do, so to, for indexing, you use the square brackets and you do a square one is the L, you know, zero, one is L. If I do minus one, it's the last one, so E, and minus three is the I. One, one two, three, minus three. Um, if we talk about indexing, uh, that means we can talk about the length of a string. And the Python has a built-in function that's called len for length. Um, it can return the length of a whole bunch of objects, uh, but with some very complex objects, it might not return what you think you want, what you want. Um, and in the, with those complex objects, often they will have another method associated with the object to know the length or size or whatever you, you need to know. But for a string, it works. Uh, length A is six, uh, clear six characters, that works. So here I've put a bunch of example on slicing, which are pretty much a um, complete abstract, um, a summary of everything that's possible with slicing. Um, I find it useful to have it all at one place. So, uh, does everyone understand what I mean by slicing first? Good. So, um, one first thing to understand is when you do a slice, often you do a first element, last element, but in Python, the last element isn't included. The last element is in fact, um, in fact, what it tells you is, is the, the, the number of elements from the, from the start. So here I want to start from zero and have one element. Okay, so it will only give me the C of Claire. Here it tells me I want, I want to start from zero and have three elements, so C, L, A. Okay, uh, you, can, you can omit start and end indexes, and in this case that means you, if you omit the start, you, that means you start from the start of your um, object. So it's the same thing as zero to three, it's this. If you omit the end, that means you want to write everything from start to, from whatever start you specified to the end of your object. You can have a stride. Um, so here it says, I want to go from the start to the end for, by a step of two. So every other character from start to end. Finally, um, if you put this zero to minus one, it's not the whole string because as I said, the last index is not um, included. So you will be missing one element. This again is not the whole string either. So if you want everything to the end, the best is just to omit the end, um, to omit the end in your specification. You can also use the length to make sure you include the, the end. And it works because indexes start from zero. So the length is always plus one from the index of the last character. 
And you can also obviously uh, define your slices with expressions. Um, um, so if I execute all this, as I said, the first one is just one character, and then we have the three first characters, zero to three or start to three. We have the three last characters, three to the end. We have every second character with a step or the stride. Here we can see that if we specify minus one, are we missing one character? And uh, if we specifying specifying the length of the whole object, then we uh, get to the end. Okay. Um, so I know sometimes it can get a bit. Some people find it weird that the last index in the uh, slash is not included and can uh, mean a bit of getting used to. The nice thing is that it avoids a lot, a lot of minus one in your specifications of, um, of slices. For example, if you want to get the three first character, you can simply say, you can simply, simply have the slice here, you know? So you just have three. If you included the last character, you would have to have three minus one or calculate separately. So I don't three like that. Sorry. If you want two characters from the second character, you do from two to two plus two, you know, and not from two to two plus two minus one. So um, yeah, it's actually very really good not to include the last character. It simplifies a lot in additions. Any question on slicing? No? Uh, one thing I didn't mention maybe with a stride, um, you, can, you can have things like um, three to the end, every two, so you can omit whichever or have everything specified. Um, it just work, you know? Um, it, it knows which one is omitted because, um, because of, the, of the format of everything. Okay, so now that we saw slicing, we can see the loops. Okay, the so first thing to know about loops is they are best to be avoided in Python. Obviously, of, sometimes you need a, a loop, so it's good to know how to do it, but they are not very efficient. Are very, um, a lot of Python code and Python method and Python packages are defined and um, designed to be used without loops to avoid loops. Um, but yeah, sometimes you need. What you need to know is you can loop on any iterable object. So you can loop on a string. You, it's not necessarily just a range of numbers. You, know, you can loop on a, over a lot of different objects. Um, so if you want every character in a string, you don't need to go um, through the length of the string and taking the index of, the, of your string. You just go for the looping um, variable here is car for character in my variable a and then the semicolon and then very importantly there's an indentation here that defines that this line is in my loop and if you see there's no need there's no way no need to close the loop Okay, so there's no indication the loop is closed. So if I run this, you know, it prints every single character one after the other. Okay. So to go back to the indentation on how to close a loop, here for example, I have a loop here that starts and then I have three lines. The first two one are indented 
and the last one isn't. So that means the first two lines are in my for loop and the last one isn't. So if I run it for there, um, you know, it will. Is the indentation just a tab press? Yes. Yes. Uh, so you see, it will, uh, because I have six characters, it will uh, write to me the first two lines six times, and then it will write to me the last line here, which is outside of the loop. May I quickly jump in? I think the question was, um, you don't, you don't have to use a tab. You just have to use, you have to, you have, you can use either spaces or tabs and you have to be consistent in your indentation. So it yes, has to be. What, that's what I'm going to after. Okay. Good. Uh, so yeah, so for the indentations, yeah, it's a tab, it's a space, whatever, but it has to be the same indentation for a one block of code. So here, for example, I have, a for loop, the first line is indented once, the second is indented twice, and it's going to tell me unexpected indent. That means it doesn't know what to do with this line. It's supposed to be in another sub block, but there's no definition of the sub block. It's not part of the for loop, and it just it can't deal with it. So you do whatever, whatever indentation you want, but it has to be consistent. And to close a loop or a if um, or I don't know a while or other things like that, you just have to go back. And it's the same when you define a function. Um, when you define a function, you have your definition of the function, and then the code in the function is indented, and you get out of the function by um, removing the indentation, which is Somewhat annoying, especially when you reformat code, um, because then you can very quickly lose track of what was in which loop and what was in which if condition. Um, so yeah, be, be mindful of that. Um, it's That's really scary. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's maybe not the best option, the best um, design, uh, that the designer of Python came with. Um, I know that programmers are lazy, but uh, putting an N4 or whatever it is, not that much work. Anyway, uh, yeah, just remember indentation is important. Okay, any other question on the loops? Okay, so you can obviously loop over a range of number and uh, Python comes with a range function that allows you to de uh, easily define a range. So this function takes a start, an end, a stride, a bit like slicing, and again like slicing, the end index is not uh, included. Uh, so if I run this, you know, is I start at three, I go every other numbers, and it's three, five, then up to 15, and uh, 17 is not included. Okay. So you can obviously, you can also uh, just have one number in the range function. In this case, is the number of elements you want starting from zero. So this gives you zero to four. Um, it's quite often used this way. So, yeah. You can also have nested loops and that's where the indentation is pretty, um, can get tricky. Uh, so here I have a loop over I and in which I do a loop over car and I print car in the inner loop and in the outer loop up in the index i. So if you look at what it looks like, um, I, I go for i equals zero, I print my three first characters of a, I print my index zero, and then I reprint my three first character of a and print my index one. Okay. Uh, so you can see this one is outside the inner loop because it's indented 
uh, the same as the four here. Uh, so. It also means the code, all, the path and codes always look very pretty because the indentation is always right, but um, yeah, it can be tricky at the start. Uh, Python always also provides a break and continue statements. I didn't get, put an example with continue, but the break statement here, um, you know, I have a four i that goes from zero to nine, but as I say, if i equals the length of a, then I get out of the loop, and so I can see at the end of my loop, my i is equal six and not nine. Uh, so it didn't go through the whole loop. Um, so I just break statement. Continue is obviously the opposite. There's also a world construct. Um, it's the same principles. Uh, so I'll let you discover it on your own if you need it. Um, it's on the, uh, in the Python uh, documentation. Yeah. Okay. For the if constructs now, it's again the same principle with indentation. You have an E, your same principle, you have a semicolon here. Um, there are several ways to do uh, equalities and comparisons. I give a few here. So, for example, you can check whether something is in your object. Um, here it's a character in a string. And if I execute this, it says yes, because L is in my uh, class string. I can do equalities with double equal. Uh, it works for strings as well as other um, objects. For the negations, there are a lot of ways to do neg negation. Uh, you can say not equal this way, with the exclamation mark. You can say not something in something. Or you can say something not in something. Um, so all of this work, you see, um, this one was the condition was false, so it didn't print anything, and these two the conditions were was true, so it printed uh, things. Okay, and you have the and and or operation operators which are simply written and and or. Um, like this, and work in like in other languages. Um, I, they are obviously they are also are uh, greater than, smaller than, um, greater than equal or smaller than equal. Um, just refer to this section of the Python documentation for to have all the comparisons uh, possible. And and there is also operator precedence. Uh, that means uh, whether and is before not or in or all the stuff like that. Uh, it's very well explained in the Python documentation. So again, I've put the link there. Go through that. Um, if you're not sure, put parentheses around your expressions um, as that will always protect for operator precedence. Everyone understand what operator precedence means? Good. Okay, and finally, I wanted to illustrate two functions that are often forgotten, uh, but can be useful. It's the any and all functions, which are built in. Um, any x is an object, returns true if at least one value in x is true, and all x returns true if all value in x are true or x is new. So what is true and what is not true in Python? Um, in Python, zero, false, and none are false. Everything else is true. So A is still equal to Claire. So if I do all A is true because all my characters in Claire are, are not zero or false or none. Um, so it's all true. If I define an empty string, B, and I go through B, or and any, you can see that all tell me it's true. Um, 
And that's where here it's our x is not is a null. So an empty string is a null string. So b is still a string. It's it's null, so it's true. Okay. But if any of b is false because there is not a single value in it that is true. It can be a bit tricky, but um, it's quite useful sometimes to know whether um, an object that is written by a function has any length at all, for example. Um, yeah. Just to remember, they are there and can be useful. So. Okay, um, we have 10 minutes to go. Um, I will stop sharing probably and see if there are any other questions. Um, so is there any questions? And I see there's something in the chat that, uh, oh, it's from, okay. I know it goes pretty quickly, um, but hopefully there are concepts you've seen in other languages, so um, you're not completely lost. That's why there's no question. I had a question. If you can hear me, yes. Um, I just <laughs> sorry, I kind of missed the any and all functions and what their uh, what what their use is for. Like, um, when you've said all a, I'm not sure what that really means when it returns true. Okay, I will share again. So, yeah, uh, that would be good. I missed that too. Thanks. No worries. And um, Hogger and Paula, if you come up with an example uh, a bit more, um, that, that can be good as well. Um, so for example, if I do all A, it looks, so as I said, A is a string, but it has six elements, right? Um, it's an interval, it has a length of six, each character is um, um, an element. So it will look at every, character of my string, Claire, and see whether each of them is true. So, and as I said here, pretty much everything is true in Python except zero, false, and none. So if you see in Claire, the C character is not none or false or zero, so it's true. The L is true, A, I, so on, is true. So all of them return a true uh, value. So my old function will, will return true. But for example, if I have a function that might return a string, but in some conditions will not return a string, for example, or will return an empty string, like here, I can use the any um, function. And if it returns false, I know that uh, my f I know that my string is empty, for example. And so in this case, I can say, oh, okay, so I'm in, I'm in this case on my, of my program and I do this. But if I have a non-empty string, I do something else. Does that clarify a bit? Um, so just checking the, so false is returned for an empty string because it's a, um, yeah, so I, I'm just not sure why all and any return different things for B. B? Okay, so for B, okay, okay, so an empty string is not zero, is not false, and is not none. It's actually, it's what person consider a new, okay? Because it is still, it is a string, it's just empty. Uh -huh. Okay. And so all will be true. And I know I, I put it there because it's very confusing. Uh, don't, don't get me wrong, I put it there because it's confusing. Um, it's something you may have just to accept that it's the way pattern will, will work is that if you have an empty object, um, all will return true, but any will return false. Okay, so to check if an object is empty, 
you should you should use any and you shouldn't use all for example okay okay so it's just to check if you have a value assigned yes um, not yeah not necessarily a value assigned but because here b has a value assigned it's the empty string but it just says nothing in your object that you're in your iterable I think I think this really gets into it's the, the any and all you usually use in this some sort of collection like um, either a list or something else where you have many values that might be either true or false and then any and all do exactly what you expect it to do so if if you have a few true and a few false statements in there any will use will will yield true because some are true but all will yield false because not all are true. We can we can go back to it next week. Hopefully, I'll remember because next week we'll introduce a few more iterable um, uh, iterable uh, objects in Python, um, which are kind of like uh, numbers and things like that. And you will probably understand better uh, what what it does and how to use it. Uh, but I definitely put this example here because it's not straightforward what you would expect necessarily yeah. um yeah these are the edge edge cases that you always get into when you define a language yes um. <laughs> <coughs> sorry so we have um a question um can you guide us through the notebook session does it show us how to connect to gadi uh, i mean uh, if you could share the link, uh, Claire said you would, Holger. Oh yes, the notebooks. Um, you know the oh. training you did on the notebooks. Yes, yes. Uh, let me let me quickly bring it up. Um, uh, because otherwise we're go also going to send um, a message where when we have this video or we record it today. Yes. When we have this video of today uploaded, we will send an email. We can also send a link to the notebook. Um, session at this link. That's okay. Um, let me, so we have we have our own uh, YouTube channel. Uh, could we show that I have the. Yeah. Um, Claire, can yeah. you hear me? So we have yeah. we have our own YouTube channel on this link that I've just posted. And um, all the all our training videos um, that we've ever made um, are on there. So this one will be there probably by tomorrow. Um, and you can find uh, you can find our Jupyter notebook training session there as well. Okay, um, pretty. Uh, yeah. Uh, so here, when you when we use the function all, uh, a is a string, right? So can we use the same function uh, to find if we are having any zero or false values in a big data array or a, a huge data set or text file or something like that? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, you, so your object needs to be iterable and iterable means you can uh, get to element by element in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if it is a data array, can I just give the name of the data array directly instead of A? Yeah, you can. Um, I, I, won't, I wonder, I've, I haven't checked, but maybe X-ray also has an all and any, but I don't think so yet. Normally, uh, all, all with the data array there should work. Okay, okay. Thank you. No worries. And there was another question on the chat. Um, Charlotte, I don't know what you mean by faceted values. Is Charlotte still here? Hi there, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. Um, so when you slice, for example, if you've got a 3D data set and you slice in time um, and you set it up, so that you want to do a range of slices, for example, like the first 10 slices, the first 10 time steps. Can you loop over the, uh, if you've got several faceted values to produce a plot, for example? 
Um, I'm not sure I still, I don't, I'm not sure I understand still. I, I think this is a very specific question. Um, I would recommend um, you send this to, you're, you're, part of, you're part of the center, aren't you? Yes. Yes, you can just send them to, um, to our help desk okay. with, more, with, with explicit thing, ideas about what you want to do. And then we'll come back to you and tell you exactly what, what to do this. I think um, this, is, this might be, require a little bit more uh, introduction to what you mean with this faceted values and these things. And I think that's outside the scope of this training session. Okay, fine. Thank you. I, I do think the answer is yes, but um, a bit <laughs> like the short answer is yes. The, the longer answer, yeah, it really depends on exactly what you, what you want to do and what you mean. Okay. Um, and other, yeah. Okay. Thank you. It's 2 p.m. Um, the dot. Yes. I can tell you what we're going to see uh, next week if you want to. Uh, I forgot what it is, so I haven't checked yet. Um, yeah, it's all the, it's typically all the types that are very useful in um, in Fort, in Python. Sorry, we're not doing Fortran. Um, <laughs> and a few there will be a few exercises, or at least one exercise there. Um, to go through because we're going to see a few more advanced um, concepts. Okay, thank you. Good. Thank you very much, Claire. And thank you very much for coming. Um, it's nice to see so many people. It always, ma it always makes us feel appreciated. <laughs> so please come back next week uh, when Claire will continue with her introduction to Python series. Thanks and see you then. <laughs>